Hello, and welcome to a virtual museum visit of the National Museum of Korea. I'm Epi Pamkeli, and thank you for joining me. A bit of a background about me. I have a background in history and art history. I have a master's in exhibition design. I work in museums in DC, I specialize in museum lighting. And while the pandemic was going on, my coworker and I uh, we're unable to do our jobs as museum lighting designers. So we did virtual museum tours weekly for our museum staff, which ended up being about 60 plus museums by the end of it. So uh, I figured I could skateify some of them and show them to all of you since we had done the work and it'd be a shame to let it go to waste. So then this is the National Museum of Korea in Seoul and right and in 2017 they had three and a half million visitors. It was originally established in 1909 as the Imperial Household Museum and it went through um, a couple different iterations like during the Japanese colonial period um, there was two entities that and then in 1945 it became just one entity. And over the years, it's absorbed a lot of other branch museums, like the Gaesong City Museum um, in 1946, in 1950, the National Folk Museum. There's also been, um, in 1969, they integrated the uh, Doksugong Art Museum. And at this point, there's 13 regional national museums for branches throughout Korea, but this is the main one, again, in Seoul. So. This is currently the sixth largest museum in the world, based on square footage of 3,180,000 square feet. It was opened in October 28, uh, 2005 in Yangsan Family Park. It was originally designed by uh, Kim Jong-il, and its, former, its location was the former U.S. Air Base and Golf Course. There are six permanent exhibition galleries, which are all here. On the right hand side there's the brief history and ancient history gallery on the first floor along with the medieval and early modern history galleries second floor is the donation gallery and the calligraphy and painting galleries and then on the third floor is the asian art gallery and the sculpture and crafts gallery now they are very proud of this building you know if you go on their website you can find all sorts of information about it how it's ready for a 6.0 earthquake uh, with a lot of shock absorbent platforms for their cases and um, basically what they have done for the design is that they're doing that you know this part of the museum is the past and you know this part of the museum is the future like the, the kids section is over here and things of like that and based off of their website they say you know the basic concept of the new museum is to reinterpret the traditional architectural spirit of Korea in a contemporary way an open plaza, open plaza um, designed to evoke Maru, which is a wooden floor and architectural element unique to Korea. It's open to all visitors, and the plaza serves as a gateway to every point in the museum, including the exhibition halls, the special exhibition gallery, and staff offices. Mountains and water are pivotal aspects of the Korean landscape. Like yin and yang, mountains and water coexist as elements of harmony and balance. Together, they generate prosperity and stability, in accordance with traditional Korean architecture, the NMK building is located deep within its lot, far from the boundaries. The museum faces south, with mountains behind it, and water in front. Um, so here you can see how, again, it's been kind of laid out on this former air base and golf course. They have a uh, subway system that comes like right into it here along with um, a lot of things to do while there. They utilize the outside of the museum well with these large banners to let you know uh, what exhibitions are there. And the collections reflect Korean history, um, especially archaeological and historic artworks. There's over four, there's 410,000 pieces in the collection and there's at least 15,000 items on display at any given time. And again, this is just more views of different special exhibits they have going on you know they're just really utilizing the space that they can while still allowing light into 
the space. And, and I always love looking at night views to see what the museum looks like at night. This is just a view of what it looks like on the inside because when you go through Google Arts and Culture, you don't really see um, this aspect of the museum. They, they always collect the images in the, uh, when the museum is closed. So that you, this is what it would look like with people all in it. So I'm going to go ahead and move out of the PowerPoint. This is, I'd like to show off the um, museum website. That's always one of my favorite things to do. Again, we uh, as it's common right now in the COVID recovery era, um, you know, they have a lot of, you know, what to do to stay healthy and a lot of places are making book tickets online. So it shows, you know, some of the exhibitions that are coming up are on display as well as some of the special exhibitions. And yes, they do have European artwork that comes through as well, which we'll take a closer look at later. And they have a lot of um, information on their website for the collections as well as, you know, videos and things and interactive guides. So as I said, uh, we have the, the history, green history and ancient history on the first floor, uh, as well as second floor up we have calligraphy, painting and donated works, and the third floor is the sculpture and crafts and the world art galleries. And, you know, here you could learn some more about each of these spaces. And they've actually uh, been renovating some of them. So some of them look, as they go through Google Arts and Culture, you'll see that they look different. And I was like looking at their other maps as well, that you can see that they have a lot of things that you can look for in the museum. Um, so it's just really showing you your amenities while there. And then this is the special exhibitions page, which has some of their special exhibitions from the past, which we'll also take a look at closer later. And again, as I mentioned, they have a lot of videos online, um, as well as things to listen to and children's activities. So this is a basic Google Arts and Culture page. It always starts with, you know, a little description of the museum. Sometimes they're longer. This is a kind of short one. And they have what they call these online exhibits when um, they're really just mainly flip books here where you can learn about something thematically and go through. Sometimes there's embedded videos. Um, they also have you know, they, a couple objects in the collection that you can see organized by type. You also can, this is organized by popularity. You can click it to have it organized by time of when things were made, as well as by color. And the nice thing about Google Arts and Culture is similar to a museum collection website, which I also recommend you take a chance to look at when you have the time, it allows you you know, to zoom in, you can really get a close look at some of the artwork. You know, you can see how the um, art was made, which I'm, again, as Skadians, everyone loves because they like being able to see how things are made, as well as a short description, which is normally not as long as it is on the actual collection website of the museum. And it lets you know about things that are similar to it so on and so forth. And then it always ends with a little entry into the museum. So I picked out some key views that we're gonna take a look at just to help ease things so we're not clicking around. The, a lot of times on Google Arts and Culture, you'll see at the bottom these tabs, which will let you click to jump to another piece of artwork. Now, we are here in you know the main open plaza that we saw a photo of earlier. Unfortunately, a lot of things in this museum, we can't actually get into the galleries, uh, but that's okay because there's still plenty to look at. For example, we have here, as you can see, a very tall pagoda. 
So this pagoda was made in 1348 and it's 13.5 meters tall. It was the fourth year of the reign of Goryeo's king, Chungmuk, and the pagoda was sponsored by the Goryeo people in, associated with China's Yuan dynasty. So coming off of the collection website, um, this platform is sculpted with seeds of the Yuji, which is Journey to the West, as well as lions, dragons, and lotus flowers. The lower four stories are sculpted with scenes of Buddha's assembly, while the upper six stories are sculpted with images of Buddha with both hands clasped. The four sides of the platform and those of the lower three tiers are protruding, recalling the shape of the Tibetan Mongolian pagodas that were prevalent in the Yuan period. However, the upper seven tiers have a more standard rectangular shape that corresponds with the conventional form of stone pagodas. So kind of hard to get a good view on it here, but again, collection website would give you a better close up on what they are describing. Now this is the first known pagoda made of marble instead of granite, and it was made at the Guan Guang Chansa Temple, which is located at the foot of Mount Buso. And this shape is um, abnormal for a pagoda, but that's part of what makes it so unique. The eaves of the stone, of the roof stones, reflect the influence of the Goryeo wood, wooden architecture that was common in the area. And the pagoda was actually taken from its original site and smuggled to Japan in 1907 by the Japanese Minister of Imperial Household Affairs. So, really crappy of the Japanese to do that, um, but it was recovered with the help of two Western journalists, Ernest T. Bethel from England and Homer Holbert from America, who launched an international press campaign talking about the theft in 1918. And so the pagoda was reconstructed, was moved back to Korea and reconstructed at Gyeongbokgung Palace in 1960, where it stayed until 1995. At that point, it was dismantled, so that way it could have conservation work done on it, um, because it had been outside basically until this point, so there had been acid rain, weathering. And then when the museum opened in 2005, it was reassembled inside this new building, and it was unveiled with all the conservation work. Um, as part of the museum's grand reopening, or grand opening in 2005. So it was also monumental because 120 years after the pagoda was built, uh, the Joseon Royal Court erected a stone pagoda with a similar material and shape at the Wangaksa Temple in Guangzhou. And so it had larger impacts on the architectural elements of the area, despite again being an odd shape and the different stone top. So here we can see the center of the um, entrance area. They have directional signage as well as a nice little standing um, sign to help point you in a direction to see things. It's, as you can tell, it's very neutral down here. There's not a lot of color. There's a little bit of guidance for different floors. You can see the, the pagoda we were talking about in the distance. But um, again, just very neutral down here. So here we have moved um, into some of the early history galleries. And what you're looking at are a pair of bronze horses, which um, they are made in the sixth century, which you can kind of see, like, you know, there's the nose, the rider's in the middle, there's a little bit of a can uh, the tail sticking out at the end there. And it's a pair of ceramic vessels which are depicting a master and servant on horseback. So this is the master's um, sculpture. We'll get the servant's one in a moment. They're uh, excavated from the Gyeongnyeongcheong uh, Gyeong tomb in Gyeongju. And each vessel contains a rider and short-legged horse atop a thick rectangular base. Each horse is hollow with a hole in the back and spout in the front. They're likely used to serve liquids. The master is wearing a cone-shaped hat with bands and ornaments along with armor on its lower body. And the horse has a horn-like ornament on its head showing that it was decorated for a special ceremony. And then we'll take a look at 
This is the servant, which is a little bit harder to see. Um, it's bare chested with a top knot tied with a cloth. So you can see a little tiny top knot on the top of his head. He carries luggage strapped to his back and is holding a bell in his right hand as if to guide his master. And there's similar trappings on both horses, but there's no stirrups on this one. And vessels that were made to look like people, like these two, were probably made for ritual purposes rather than daily use. And experts believe that these two vessels were used at a funeral or memorial service to express the mourner's wish for the peace of the deceased and his or her rebirth after death. Um, and you can also see here some nice little internal case lighting upwards, um, little fiber optics probably, looking at the horse from all four angles. And they've just done a really nice job with you know, background of the uh, landscape there. They've also covered with some shades, decorative shading, the um, windows in the background. This museum does a lot of neutral tones, but they and they have a lot of internally lit cases like we see here. And so we're basically just hopped down the hallway here. Uh, and we're going to go look at some of the famous crowns, but first I wanted to show you, you know, they kind of have the entrance before going to look at that crown of informational banners, again, internally lit cases, and they're kind of really prepping you for what you're about to see. You know, they have a video right there, and um, you can see that they had an entrance graphic leading you into the special exhibition, which truly is one of the highlights of their collection. So with no further ado, we're going to come on in and look at this crown. So here they finally added some color, you know, a nice deep rich blue, which really helps offset the gold of the objects as well as the nice warm colored floors. So this room uh, was clearly constructed for this object. We'll also take a look at the lighting above it in a moment, and you'll see that the light track is very meant, very much meant to focus on a single object in the middle of the room. So this is also um, from the Sila period, which is the South the Central Korean Kingdom from 55 to 935 CE. This is from the fifth century. The uh, crown is 27.3 centimeters tall, and the girdle, which is this piece here on the bottom, is 120 centimeters long. And these were found in the Guangnam Jetong tomb in Guangzhou, and which was a double tomb. It was two tombs linked on the north with access. Um, the south mound is the king's tomb and the north with the queen's. And so the girdle came from the north mound. Now, what you can kind of see here is you can see that on top of the crown, um, there's three branch-shaped uprights and two antler, well, here you can see it, antler-shaped uprights, which would have been attached to the inside of the crown base with gold nails. The upper and lower boundaries of the crown base are decorated, uh, the upper with a double line of continuous dot patterns and the lower with a single wave, single line of wave patterns. And there's numerous carved jades attached to the base and stems of the artwork. Exhibitions at the site also uncovered six gold earrings um, with thick hollow rings. And there's also uh, the belt, which has 28 rectangular metal plates connected together, um, kind of dangling off of it. And all the different dangling pendants are shaped like various objects with some symbolic significance. The objects um, include a medicinal pouch, which represents the treatment of disease, a fish, which is food, a hand knife, which is an everyday auto item, whetstone pincers used for making iron products, and the pendants also includes a, um, a lot of curved shade, which is symbolizing life. So very much a highlight of the collection. Um, and as I mentioned, if you look up, the, the lighting track was made clearly for a object to be at the center of the room. And I'm just going to hop to the next square here, and you can see that you know they have this the frosted glass, so that way, again, it's very directional where they want people to come in and get the full all of it from the front side with that entrance graphic we looked at briefly in the video before coming in to see the actual object here. So here we're just taking a quick look in their Buddha room. Um, 
I always find this to be a very serene room. And as I mentioned, they've done renovations on parts of the museum. So this is one of the newer sections. Uh, right behind, you can kind of see a little hint of windows. So there's windows behind here. And to help block the light, they have uh, pull down screens as well as these cut out wood, uh, black screens. Which kind of makes the uh, Buddha's sculptures look like they're floating. You know, they're just, they're being lit, they're being little spots of light, so they're, and uh, onto the blackness. And so it's just like they're Buddhas of light floating in darkness. Um, and they also have a built in case or built-in uh, piece here for this one. And all these different Buddhas are different styles, different eras, uh, to kind of show the evolution in Korea. So this is an entrance to um, the metal crafts area and the Buddhist sculpture area. Again, this is one of the older entrances. So they're, they love their big graphics. We have timelines, they like their timelines. Um, this is before they redid some of it. Uh, here is the metal crafts that I mentioned, the little peeking peekaboo back towards the gallery. And what you're seeing here is a lot of their zong bells, uh, which are common in Chinese tradition, uh, which due to the proximity to Korea, it's clear why they came through. Um, they're clapperless spells that are generally polyphonic, so if you hit them with a mallet, you can get two different tones out of the bells. And this is what their newly renovated area looks like. Again, they have a lot of internally lit cases with fiber optics coming down. And they're starting to add a bit more texture and warmth with the wooden floors as opposed to just the plain marble everywhere. And you can see, like, this exact same bell that you saw before, so this is what it looked like before the renovation. And the way that I figured out, um, you know, that there was a renovation is because if you're going through the, art, the Google Arts and Culture, it'll pop you kind of between the two. And so I tried to stick with the newer versions that I could find, um, but again, not everything is available. So you can see that this is the same as that bell we were looking at a moment ago. You know, same exact as that one, just when they renovated, they moved it into that other space where before it was here by this big window. And you can see what it looked like before with like the plain wood, where then they added the warmer wood in the renovation. And this is, you know, what that exact same space looks like now. It's just kind of a rest area between galleries. So here we're looking at uh, the Celadon and in particular we're taking a look at this bamboo sprout shaped ewer with a lid. It's from the Goryeo dynasty which is about 918 to 1392 and it's found in the Gaetong area which is the southern part of North Korea. It's 23 centimeters tall and at the bottom its diameter is 8.4 centimeters. Now um, celadons are porcelains that are first coated with glaze and then fired at a temperature of about uh, 1,300 degrees celsius and then to produce um, them you have to have really sophisticated technology to get the temperature right, so the kilt still have anything bad happen, and the essence of the Gloria uh, celadons lie in their unique pale green blue color. The original uh, inlay technique is another major characteristic of the Goryeo Celadons and is considered one of the biggest achievements for the Korean art of pottery. And Celadon that's made into the shape of an animal or a plant is called sculptural Celadon. The entire surface of the piece is evenly coated with a jade color glaze but is otherwise free from extraneous decoration, which was what considers it a ma masterpiece. And they're considered at, regarded as classic wares of Korean porcelains. They are crafted into various everyday wares such as pots, bottles, kettles, dishes, candlesticks, pillows, roof tiles, and incense burners. So 
a lot of uses. And you, know, you can see here again, they're, they're embracing their timeline. They do love their timelines, as well as um, another video here, which as if you went through, you'd notice it changes dates. But again, they're still keeping things pretty plain, even though they are finally adding a bit more color with a nice dark purple and the warmer wood colors on the ground. With the, and as you go through, again, like, they also have added some green, and they're really just trying to uh, add a bit more pop after the original plain tan that you saw before. So this is one of their newer entrance graphics. As I mentioned, they did have, um, they do love their big graphics. So I'm going to give you a quick look a boot. Um, they have their, their uh, one of the issues with Google Arts and Culture, if you click too far, there you go. Um, so they've also changed out the original small signage for this, these larger pieces. It kind of shows you where you are on the map. And you know, we have these lovely skylights. There's not, we, we don't really have access in Google Arts and Culture to the second floor. Like as you see here, we have one, three. So I can't show you that, but I did want to show you what I could. And again, it's just very plain and basic out here. And um, we basically just went around in a big circle. I know I didn't really wa literally walk you around the top here, but that is essentially what happened. And one of my favorite things to do in museums on Google Arts and Culture is also find all their different fire hydrants, or not fire hydrants, fire extinguishers, and how they hide or don't hide them. It's really amusing, this thing to look at cultural differences. So here you have how they're now displaying a lot of the, the white porcelain. So I did want to take some time. I mentioned the spe uh, special exhibits earlier. And I pulled up two of them. This is the special exhibition that's on Kazakhstan, the Cradleland of the Golden Man. Now, these are supported not through Google Arts and Culture, but through something called Matterport. Again, if we go back to the exhibitions on exhibits online, these are the different exhibitions they have supported by Matterport. I, I do recommend if you have time, take a look through them. The Etruscans Rise into Rome, that was a hot contender for me showing to you today, but we don't have that much time. So I, I'm not going to, but the one, the one downside about Matterport is that I can't pull up separate tabs like I did with Google Arts and Culture. So it's very similar. You know, it kind of showed you the dollhouse there for a moment and it'll let you kind of do the same walk through different view aspects. Um, it shows you the dollhouse. You can see how everything's kind of laid out. You can just do a straight down floor plan and it lets you measure things, but we, we don't need to measure things. So you can just go right back to the start here. So they kind of have their built in uh, special, these are some of their special exhibits. So their built in special exhibit uh, gift shop as a museum. Uh, sorry, what's that? As a museum professional, um, you know, I see these and I'm these blocks and I'm like, oh, I wonder how many people sat on them because visitors do love to sit on things they're not supposed to. So same thing as always, they have a variety of languages for their different uh, labels as well as their nice big entrance graphic. And it's kind of the same thing as Google Arts and Culture, as we, we follow the little circles. As you see, it's directional with that arrow. And we have another big graphic. And these special exhibitions are when the museum becomes very theatrical. So we're getting dark walls with highlight lights. And truly, for me, these. Uh, pedestals and cases that they have for the objects remind me a lot of Star Trek 
you know, you can kind of get another view right here where it's just very uh, futuristic, if you ask me. And you can, you know, pull up the objects, you can, you know, scroll in on them, learn more about them, which you can't get when just viewing. And this, it's a very impressive, again, very theatrical exhibition. And as you go through, you can learn about the different pieces of it. Now, I will also say that with Matterport, a lot of times they'll have um, different colored circles. So if they had a YouTube video or something, it would be a red colored circle, which you could click on and it would link you to the YouTube, which is something that you'll see in the Etruscan uh, exhibition if you come back and take a look at it later. And, you know, we have kind of the pseudo, this is reminiscent of a yurt to me, um, set up. We learned some about the saddles. Uh, I'm cutting across, don't tell them I didn't follow the arrows, where you can see some of the historic saddles in these internally lit cases with the backdrops, you know, pieces of tack. And they have a combination here of projections and prints, and I'm sure that these projections move of, you know, create a very engaging display for this special exhibition, which you do have to pay extra to get into. And this is another special ex exhibition. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am an equestrian, so of course I have to show all the pony things. And it's the uh, same thing of Matterport. They do the same design of strong entry graphic, big signs, You know, this is all a projection here on the back. And they're really trying to draw you in to these special exhibitions because this is where they make the most money. And so you see here they have a very low light level for the clothing. But you can always get Click. Oh, hello, load there. Click and you can learn more. Uh, sometimes with Matterport, they'll have these translated. Sometimes they won't, depending on the museum. Uh, you know, we have for the, the archers among us, we have various bows and arrows, different tools. It, it's just something very fun to check out when you have the time. We have saddles, we have a nice cutout, we have, again, the yurt style going on here with even a, with a hana and the roof ring above. For those of you who camp in a yurt, a pensa can feel, you know, a little bit at home with this. Again, this stirrups, bows, arrows. And so they go for very, as I said, I keep saying, very dramatic feels in their special exhibitions. So I hope that you have enjoyed coming with me on a little virtual tour, pretty quick and dirty, of the National Museum of Korea. I do recommend taking a look for yourself when you have the time, um, whether on the Google Arts and Culture page, the collection website, or the uh, special exhibitions page, because there is a lot you can learn, again, as 
Skadians, the museum websites are vast uh, collections of information that we can use for our research. And I really do recommend learning how to use them so you can look at objects and get more information on them. Uh, thank you all, and I hope that you'll check out some of my other tours. Bye now.